the next topic is he for she, the next frontier. And actually, we have two of the speakers with us. The other two are running, because we're running a little ahead of schedule. So we're going to start um, with our moderator, who today is going to be the CEO. He's the CEO of Gather and the co-founder of Fatherly, father.ly, which is an awesome new platform for fathers. As women rise, more fathers are coming together um, and, and as a community. Um, his name is Simon Isaacs. And he will be talking to TV personality and humanitarian Nigel Barker. So please help me welcome them. Uh, well, thank you. And uh, we, Nigel and I, wish there was uh, more guys in the room. Um, <laughs> Um, so well, there, there's, there's here one guy, a lone man. I'm sure there's more than one in, in the audience. Hey, listen, we showed up at least. <laughs> totally. <we>? So <laughs> we're at a, this is maybe telling of the state of he for she. Um, and so you know, what we want to talk a little bit about is what is happening in the space, where are there opportunities, um, but also on a very personal level. Um, I, pers I run a, a bunch of different companies. Uh, one of which is a, a new parenting site for men. Um, and what we're seeing in the market is uh, we're seeing the rise of women. W women in the workforce are now the majority breadwinners, which is absolutely incredible. Uh, we still have to address, of course, equal pay. Um, and now what we're seeing is the rise of dad. On the other side of the equation, we're seeing Santa Barbara, we're seeing the rapes and lynchings in India, we're seeing, of course, what's happening in Nigeria, and it's like, Nigel, that we're, we're, there's a tale of two stories that's going on here. I know in your, in your personal life and in your philanthropic and in your professional life, you see those two stories unfolding. What do you see as the sort of, why, is this, why do we have these two ju juxtaposing situations? I think we're in very interesting times. I think that obviously with communication the way it is, there's just so much more information out there. We're getting to hear about what's happening in India in unprecedented ways. Of course, this isn't new, what's happening in India. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm actually an Anglo-Sri Lankan. Both my parents born in India. Um, and actually, really, just to go back for a moment of sort of where I come from, my, my grandmother in Sri Lanka um, was the first woman to drive a car in the country, uh, was wow. outcast out of her family because she um, decided not to wear a headscarf at the time and was very sort of, I guess, just wanted to do her own thing, wanted to be her own woman at a time when it was an absolute outrage to do so. And she was literally cast out of the family. Um, when she had my mother with an English sailor, um, which again was absolutely outrageous. Um, you know, it was my mum's success in the modeling world, ironically, because obviously that I have seemed to have a legacy of that in my family. Um, but they then, my mother is also another strong woman who, who with the money she raised by the time she was 16, moved my grandmother and my aunt who was mentally disabled out of Sri Lanka and went to England to set up and start from, from anew. And I guess growing up with these strong women in the family, my grandmother, my mother, and my unbelievably doting aunt, um, it was, I, I guess it starts there. I think it really starts with the education of children as they're growing up, seeing powerful women, um, learning from them, and in, in every capacity, and seeing that equality start in the household you know, where p parents share the roles, where it's fun to be in the kitchen, and you, you, you know, I was brought up in the kitchen alongside my mum, alongside my grandmother, alongside my other four brothers, but my sisters and my dad, and we're all in there, and we're all sharing the chores. It, I never, it never sort of dawned on me that this was something mm. that was mm. a, a woman's job mm. or a man's job, and I think mm. going, growing up, that, that's very important. Mm. I think that's starting to happen now mm -hmm. in the world, more and more. Um, and that's why we're sort of beginning to see both worlds all at the same time. That's why this conversation is coming up. That's why it's obviously, this is the pivotal moment to, hit, to really tackle it, because all of a sudden, guys can't escape it. You know, we have to deal with the fact mm. that there is enormous you know, inequality and injustice. So, so before we get to the incredible work that you're doing on a philanthropic level, at a professional level, um, tell, tell us the rest of that story. So tell us how you got here, and, and more importantly, 
what you are doing in your home life to apply the same principles or carry on that tradition? Well, I mean, it's certainly, I mean, I have a little daughter, Jasmine, I have a little boy, Jack, and I have an extraordinary wife, Chrissy. And, you know, Chrissy and I met 20 years ago. Um, and I would not be the same person. Hey, I was told to come on. <laughs> Sorry, but right. We've recruited another man. All right. Thank you. I was told to come Thank on you. already. Absolutely, no, please. Um, and, and I know that I wouldn't be the same man I am today if it weren't for my wife. And, it, and, it, and it's... And really, people sometimes say, oh, well, well, that's such a nice thing to say, you know. And I don't mean it really as a compliment. I really mean it as, no, seriously, two is so much stronger than one. And she's so much more, you know, her insight into life is something that I've, I, I don't have in the same way. And I re rely on her just as she relies on me for guidance mm. and as a sounding board, as a soulmate, mm. everything. And that doesn't just end when we leave the house. And I think that's something, I mean, you know, whether that makes me a modern man or not, I don't know. I just feel that makes you human, right? Well said. So, Gary, we, we started this conversation, uh, and I know you and I were, were, were talking about this before, but about the state of he for she. Uh, um, this is specifically an area from a research and a policy perspective that you're working on with, with Gromundo. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about this, we, this sort of tale of two stories of, of on the one hand, incredible men like, like Garrett, <laughs> like Nigel, and, and then on the other side, uh, you know, uh, a pretty difficult situation around the world. Yeah. Um, sorry for arriving late, the traffic coming from the airport and the like, anyway. You let me um, decide that. Okay. Just, just, just <laughs> go straight past it. And Elizabeth, I understand, is on her way as well. Um, so apologies for the traffic. You know, I think we're, we're, we're at a very interesting moment as we look at all the amazing advances in women's rights in the last 20 years. Women are nearly, well, they're half the world's food, food producers, 40x percent of the, of the workforce outside the home now. Um, but we've not seen that other half of the revolution of men doing half the care work. Um, and there's all kinds of daily negotiations, Nigel talking about it at, at, you know, in his home. How do we talk about this every single day of living up to this new world that says equality is here, get used to it. Mm. Um, and I think we're at a really interesting moment to say the, the normative frameworks have changed, right? The laws are there. We've had Beijing in 95 and, and other platforms that are there. They're on the books everywhere that say, make this real. Now, what do we need to do to negotiate it every day at the kitchen table, in our meeting rooms to make this real? And I think part of what we've, we've been slow to figure out, oh yeah, men are part of this. We're either obstacles <laughs> or we're, we're too often the one still sort of holding the glass ceiling down. Mm. Um, or at the kitchen table to figure out, oh yeah, I have to do this stuff too. And I think what we're trying to figure out is in programming and in at the community level in schools and all the places where we make these notions of what it means to be men, how do we reconstruct them? Um, whether that's schools or the workplace or the kitchen table or the bedroom um, or health, the health sector, how do we find all those places where we say, men, it's time for us to do these things? And that they're not, you know, they don't have to be like a, a bitter tasting medicine. And in fact, I think Nigel was alluding, alluding to this as well. Our lives get better as men when we take these things on. That <laughs> equality is a happier way to live. Mm. Um, and we can see that all the time. And I think that's the difference that we're trying to push in terms of how we get men to do this. This is not men doing it for women. It's not men doing it because it's a bitter pill. Our lives get better as we do it. I, I, I do find it weird though that we constantly talk about men and women. Yeah. We start this sort of yeah. segregation so early on. We spit yeah. them up in sports Agreed. as children. We're constantly yeah. separating them. I was educated in an all boys school, yeah. you know, as a child. And, you know, it's, you start this sort of segregation yeah. very early on. Parents Agreed. do it with their kids. They treat the daughter one way, the yeah. son another. You know, it's one color for one and one color yeah. for another. We instill this difference yeah. from the get go. And we've got to somehow stop talking about us being completely different. Not that we shouldn't celebrate our differences, but there's an ele element of we're just people together. Yeah. Not men, not women, just human beings. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the yeah. Agreed. Yeah. So, so, Nigel, uh, specifically in your work and, and also in your sort of philanthropic, or it's even a terrible word because there is no philanthropy in work anymore, it's all one. Um, um, Tell us how you're applying some of this work and, and what you're up to right now. Um, well, I 
I'm actually a, a, a champion, they call me, for um, Girl Up, which is a United Nations Foundation um, campaign. And um, ironically, I don't know how I first got involved. I went to one of the events and I was listening to the, the women talking and it was very inspiring. And of course, I've got a little daughter and I, all I would love for her to do is to grow up to, to be a champion for other, late, other girls. And I, and I went up and I said, is there any way I can get involved? And I remember literally all these women looking at me and sort of slightly frowning and some smiling and some <laughs> sort of humored and like, what do you mean and how? And it turns out that I actually happen to be the only male ambassador for Girl Up, um, which I think is weird too. And I, my mantra even with the United Nations on this particular issue is that if you want you know, girls to girl up and you want women to stand up for themselves, yeah. then it's not a one-way conversation. Yeah. You know, my little daughter, she has a father, and he cares about that, and he yeah. wants her yeah. to be, he wants to be a part of her life, and he wants to be encouraging her to stand up for girls, but to stand up for everyone, to stand up for little boys too, to stand up for all of us to have equality. And, you know, so for my mission was to man up as well as girl up, <laughs> and, and to get every other man out there to do the same thing, you know. All right. So I, I want to hear about how, how tough the situation is, though. It, there's certain people, you know, I live in Park Slope, and it's all tattoos and baby Bjorns, and so it's really <laughs> easy to understand what's going on, and we can pat ourselves on the back, but that is, of course... Well, that's just the mothers, right? <laughs> 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 so. I thought you were talking about the babies. The West Village, Brooklyn. <laughs> the babies. But, but Gary, uh, put this in all into perspective. Yeah. Um, are we, do we think that we're further along in this movement than we actually are? And, and tell us a little bit about how far we actually need to go. Yeah. Well, the, you know, I think that one of the big stumbling blocks that we have to look at as the elephant in the room is that a third of the world's women will experience violence from a male partner. As we know, just the extent of men's violence against women is a huge work, amount of work that needs to be done on that. So it's not as if all men are kind of sitting there in the wings waiting to be involved in this as allies and, and voices for it. We also have to look at the Global South and say women are doing two to ten times the amount of the daily care and domestic work. Um, not to mention, you know, who's, in, who's still in charge in state houses and corporations, et cetera, around the world. So we've, we've seen lots of amazing change, but there's that still, there's a lot of men out there who haven't got this. They've not totally. drank the Kool-Aid. They've not seen how, you know, our lives get better. This is what we should be doing every single day. The other, on the other hand, though, we, we can't just look at men with that negative, you know, I think a lot of our discussion of work in Africa and Asia and parts of Latin America is, wow, how horrible men are. Actually, every single day, whether we're doing work in conflict areas in DRC or our office in Rwanda or in Brazil, there are low-income men who are doing this stuff. They get it. It resonates in their life as well. So as we work in some difficult situations, it's happening. Mm. Um, and I think the, you know, what we're trying to do is sort of nudge along, you know, with, whether we call them champions or just the, you know, the kind of everyday heroes of men who in some of the world's most gender inequitable places are already doing this. But it is a different, you know, if we arrive saying there's men doing it, we believe you can do it, your life will get better versus do we arrive, you're bad, we don't really trust you, we don't think you can do this well with your partner, your children, we don't get very far. Mm. So it, it's, it's trying to create that energy that men, your life gets better doing this. Gender equality is not this outside thing that people drew up in a drawing room in the UN late some night. It is really something that you live every day and your life gets better. And we'll often start a conversation, instead of talking about rights, et cetera, to talk about what do you want? What are you looking for in life? We'll present some data that shows um, that women say when men are doing their fair share of work, women are happier with their partner, and then we'll cite this part, and women will say on average, and we have household data that shows it, women will say their sex lives are better mm. with him, mm. not with the neighbor, not with somebody else. <laughs> so we'll also bring up, look, this is better for all of us. And guys will go kind of scratch their head maybe and then go, go try a few weeks of, man, funny, if I did a little bit more of this, we had more time to be what we want to be as a couple. It's, it's not happy really wife, tough. Happy wife, happy life. Right? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, come on, guys. So it's that equation. Get with yeah, the program. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, listen, yeah. I, I've, I've done work um, with the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric yeah. AIDS Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually on their board of directors. And I created a documentary on their work a few years ago called Generation Free and yeah. going to Tanzania, yeah. talking to the, some of the, the, well, many of the women in, in remote villages, uh, you know, and you'd, you'd meet them and they, they would, would have found out that they were HIV positive yeah. when they were fully pregnant and going in to get tested and what have you. 
at that moment, the husband's so upset by the fact that their wives are HIV positive, kicking them out of the house. They're, they're, they're then homeless, mm. eight months pregnant, and having to go through this process. And it was, amazed me at literally 90% of the women were completely forgiving of their husbands for kicking them out of the house and blaming them, yeah. you know, despite yeah. the fact it was almost guaranteed that they you know, got HIV positive in the first place yeah. from their husbands. Yeah. And you know, but this conversation, even if you bring it up at this point to the women and start to talk to them about it, it was like, oh, no, 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 we're not going to talk about that. Yeah. No, that's not what happened. So I, I think there's a, a huge hole with, where, I don't know where to begin with it, but education, I think, is the key yeah. at a very early age. We've mm. got to start yeah. with the kids. And it's a long-term you know, uh, plan we've got to work on. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's not going, like you said, it's not going to change overnight. You know, but we've got to start with education. And it takes leaders of these countries to you know, help get rid of that stigma and discrimination. Mm. Yeah, agreed. So, what do you guys think is, and maybe this is a controversial thing to say, that it's also tough out there for guys um, in, in their own way. You are the only man standing, you're the only manning up of, in Girl Up. And, and so I guess the question is, what is the role of women in supporting men, supporting women? What is the she for he for she in that <laughs> sentence? Um, and, and, and how, maybe from a, a research in the Global South, but also, yeah. Um, you know, here in, in, in New York and, and, and elsewhere, um, how, can, how can women support men in this very, for, for many, a very terrifying transition where they are no longer holding the same stature, making the same amount of money. Um, you know, men lost their jobs far greater than, than women in the recession and, and yeah. you know, a lot of them are still at home wearing jean shorts. And um, so what is the, how, how, can, how can women support men in this transition? Yeah. Um, you know, one, if we look at, I mean, I, I think we have to be careful in that women supporting men and that, you know, I think our feminist colleagues are right in saying, we don't have to tell you how to do the stuff that you should be doing anyway, <laughs> right? So on the one hand, we do, let, let's not put the burden on women of, you know, having to do this too. There's sure. a big burden on women. Men have to do their part in this. So I, I do think the, on the other hand, I think a little simplistic nudging <coughs> is quite useful. Um, so one of the things we do, we do parent training, we do a lot of training of fathers to get them involved from prenatal visits onward to try to get them, if it doesn't make sense culturally to be present at birth, at least they're there and realize they have a role. You know, the, the amazing thing, if, if a father has been present during the time of pregnancy, often, or we think anyway, that a child when it comes out of the womb already recognizes his voice. We don't really know because you can't interview children in the womb, right? <laughs> to know whether they do or not. But one of the things you can do when you're doing the training holding a baby is you can ask the father to speak and, and, and often the child will nudge its head toward the father, but if it doesn't, we'll nudge the child's head <laughs> toward the father. <laughs> so just a little bit of saying, look, the baby needs you, <laughs> right? So we need you to be part of this. So a lot of those kind of daily nudges to help men feel like we can do this, we're still men when we do it. And I think Nigel said this very eloquently. We're not, it's not that we're losing manhood, we're sort of, we're gaining our humanity mm -hmm. as we do more of this every single day. So I think that's the nudge that we need women to say as well. There's a, in, in women's heads as well, there's a lot of, heard some young men we work with in, in favelas in Rio who's like, I'd be the nice guy, but the nice guy never gets the girls, right? The, the, the tough guy, the, you know, the, the, all this stuff that we do to promote these kind of exaggerated forms of masculinities, women are a part of that too. So we also have to work with young women to say, wait a minute, um, the nonviolent guy is the guy that you should be <laughs> gravitating toward. We need to hold him up. We shouldn't give so many headlines to the horrible things that men do, but let's look at the everyday guys who are doing the kind of daily respect and mm -hmm. caregiving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To them. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think too, I mean, you don't have to go to a high school to see, obviously, yeah. you know, teenage girls kick their friends aside for mm -hmm. the guy. Yeah. Sometimes, like, guy, likewise, mm -hmm. guys for the girls, but, you know, they'll throw their, si their, 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 their friends to the, to, the, to the sidelines in order to, you know, to impress the guy, mm -hmm. you know, so they'll do that too. But I think that love conquers all. And I, and I mean, and I know that it can be a cheesy line, but I feel that there, guys do need to have that support and that some of, you know, this whole idea that you can't teach an old dog new tricks, when you're brought up to believe one thing and you've been conditioned all your life to see things in one way, 
it's, it can be hard for guys sometimes to, to get past it. And I mean, my own father, you know, he had a very hard life and it was absolutely conditioned to think that women were n not as important as himself and, and, and you know, second-class citizens almost. And I know that he struggled with it a lot, even with my mother. And he, unfortunately, he used to hit my mother. And I remember watching it as a child, you know. And I remember my brother running in one point and stopping him. And it was a turning point for the whole family because there was like my, my oldest brother coming to the rescue of my mum. Mm. And uh, it was, you know, it's one of those moments that's sort of pivotal. I'm, I'm, look at me choking up here. Yeah. Um, but it's important, right? It's yeah. important for guys yeah. to be, have that softer side and to understand yeah. it's not even a softer side. It's like that's the manly thing to do, yeah. to go in and to stop yeah. violence yeah. whenever you see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But hard, but a but hard lesson to learn. And I think you know, that this has to happen on a grand scale. I think we have to come in and educate kids from the ground up that, uh -huh. you know, that it's about loving each other, no matter who we are, no matter what sex we are, no matter how tall we are, no matter how short we are, how fat we are, how slim we are, you know, whatever the words we use, it's like we have, to be, uh -huh. we have to love each other unconditionally. And that's where it starts. I mean, it's, it's not Christian, it's not you know, uh, Muslim, it's nothing. It's, it's just being a human being. Uh -huh. you know? And I think that's where it begins. Yeah, I agree. So, if it starts at a very, very young age, and, and Gary, you work a lot with changing institutions um, at, at a global level. What are the specific, what specifically has to happen? What are you guys pushing for in key places? And, and what can this community do, or the broader movement do, to support the work that you and, and so many others are, are, are pushing forward? Yeah. Picking up on what Nigel said about, you know, how do we start early? So one, one place we're starting is the health sector. You look at health posts in the global south, mostly they're women and children. How do we set an early notion that we need men here? We need you here around reproductive health decisions, around HIV prevention. You talked about the transmission of AIDS from, from parent to children. We need you present there. We need you taking care of your own health. We need you taking care of your partner's health. That's one of the success stories in, in, in the global south in the last years has been getting basic health services out, but there's still spaces for women and children. We gotta figure out how we get men to get there for their own sake and for the sake of their partners and their children. The other is schools. How do we create notions that schools are based on fairness, that children are not statistics, we're building connection, we model in the classroom every day that, that bullying doesn't get you anywhere, that there's the speaking out of different forms of violence that happen so that every single encounter between teachers and, again, and around students is around constructing this notion that girls don't do this and boys do this, we all know how to do this stuff. Um, so I think a huge amount needs to be invested in teacher training. Teachers need, they've got to do all the daily stuff of teaching those basic skills, but they also need some basic skills in how do they model gender equality mm. in the classroom. So another, that's another space that we see. We're also trying to build into this, you know, there's a huge emphasis these days on women's economic empowerment. It's one of the success stories as well of development in the last 15 years. 125 million women are beneficiaries of microcredit programs, mostly in Africa and Asia. But lo and behold, many times they go home, they've got a bit more money in their pocket, but men are still in control of it. Or men see themselves as, wait, you don't really think I'm very useful here. You think I'm kind of a thug anyway, right? Th those who design the programs. So we're, we're reaching out to them in very simple ways. Men, we need you as part of this. We expect you to be there. We expect you to support equitable caregiving. So how to build in those kinds of levers as well. On the violence front, we've got to understand that men who use violence are usually damaged men. Mm -hmm. They themselves have witnessed it, have grown up with it. They're not gleefully there using violence against their partner. They're pretty damaged men. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to finding spaces where we say we need men to speak up and say no, but we also need ways that we break that cycle. So psychosocial support for men and women, girls and boys who have witnessed that violence so they don't repeat the cycle when they have children later mm -hmm. on. Um, that sounds easy to talk about in a two minute on a panel. <laughs> to make that happen in many, many spaces is really where we need ministries of health, ministries of education, workplaces to say, we get it, we know how to do it, we're trained and we're supported, and our bosses higher up hold us accountable for it. Um, so that's the stuff we're trying to do. We need men speaking out on it. We need women who support the notion. We need to break out of this notion that somehow the women's empowerment work is against engaging men or that's, you know, that, that this is really in it together. Right. Um, there's lots of approaches that work. How do we scale them up, make them sustainable, keep them funded, and please don't kind of reinvent it every single day. We've got stuff right. that works. Right.
Amazing work. So, yeah. so, so as you nudge uh, policy and do the hard institutional moving these sort of large ships, um, maybe maybe not as as slow as government is is media and brand and culture, um, and we're seeing some incredible transitions right in media. Particularly, you know, I'm addicted to uh, Hulu, and I watch these. You know, whether it's Parenthood or yeah. Modern Family, we're seeing new depictions of of men. Um, um, and that's you know that's changed pretty significantly since you know Tim the Toolman Taylor and and so Nigel you work in um, media what more can they do or be doing um, to advance and to nudge men forward in this effort? Well, I think it, I mean it, it's not just I mean t television is a huge problem all, all around. I mean it's not just is it a a great way to obviously educate people, but it's been for the longest time an enforcer of so many of the problems that we have. I mean, it's, it's you know, not just television, but entertainment in general, as far as man is like this, woman is like that. And, you know, and every time we, we even put some, you know, someone who's gay on TV, it's like a caricature. You know, it's constant caricaturing. Right. And, it, and then that's the problem. I mean, no doubt, and I, listen, for you that don't know, and I'm, I'm a fashion photographer, for crying out loud, right? Um, I work in the fashion business. You know, with models and you know of all the industries, which is you know such a strange business. And I've spent my life kind of battling all the stereotypes in that world, not to run away from it and say I'm not going to have anything to do with it, because I grew up in that world. But to understand that it doesn't have to be what everyone thinks it has to be. That you can make a difference and that people can stand up and we can potentially change a business which is not going anywhere. You know, the, the fashion business is not going to disappear. So you can't just put your head in the sand and say, oh, I don't like that. They got, they got it all wrong. We have to make changes within the business. And on TV, the same way. I mean, on, and through the shows I've worked on, and some of you may agree, some of you may not, but, you know, certainly with America's Next Top Model, um, that was a show which had whole bunches of unusual characters and people and, you know, craziness and zaniness. But one of the things we tried to do was actually change the landscape of you know, how people see guys, how people see, people see women, and how they see models. And we, did, we kind of successfully did it all. And there was a huge change in the 10 years that we, when we, from when we started on TV to, you know, 18 seasons later, which is what I did with that show, um, and how people perceived um, men in fashion, mm -hmm. you know, because there was myself, um, there was, you know, Miss J, you know, um, and Jay Manuel, and I know, but that's the thing. Part of the things, you've mentioned something like that, and people do laugh, and they do giggle, and of course, he's a funny character, but he's just, he's also a human being, and he, you know, he deserves to be respected for being exactly the way he is, mm -hmm. regardless of whether he's he or she or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's irrelevant. You know, it's his, how talented is he? How smart is he? How kind is he? How wise is he? And how much does he offer and talk and discuss all of that and share? And those are the things that we should be judging him by. And, and that, the show kind of pushed that through. So I think we need to see a lot more of, 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 the, of areas where we don't all play just one gender on television, that we play just, again, we play the human role. So how do we do that? Who controls, <clears throat> who makes the decisions? Who, how, is it, is it? We do, we do. I mean, it's us, it's, it's ratings. It boils down to that. You know, if, of course, you have to have compelling television. You know, we've got to tell great stories. Yeah. And it's beginning to happen. But we've got to look for the stories. People, you know, writers, ourselves, directors, people who produce TV, we have to find the stories that are out there. I mean, you know, there's nothing more interesting. It's one of the reasons why reality TV is so successful. It's because there's really nothing more interesting in a way than everyday life. You know, there's nothing funnier than everyday life. You know, that you don't have to dig deep, but we have to find those stories and we have to turn them into, you know, documentaries or docu-series or reality so people can actually, you know, get comfortable with themselves. Go, oh God, that's me, I'm, I'm not a freak. Or, you know, actually perhaps I could get help and this is, you know, where I can find it. And television can do that. You know, it doesn't do it enough. Wow. All right, so turning to, look in your crystal ball. Gary, look in your crystal ball and tell us where is this all going? Tell us, are, are we, are, do you see us making steady progress or do you see us flatlining right now? No. Are you hopeful? I am. I mean, if we, you know, I think if we look at, at well, I, I spend most of my time in the Latin America's region where we, where we have our main office in Brazil. There's two women presidents. Women's educational attainment is equal to men. Um, I, I think there's, 
there's no there's no question but that the you know the the arc of equality is working it's reaching equality in some levels at least for women and i think slowly we're seeing men get on board so i i see it more as a question of the changes happening um, contrary to what we often think, there, you know, men get it. We're not as thick-headed as we often look. Um, <laughs> men are moving ahead on this stuff. And I, I think, you know, the, the, what I see our daily work is how do we speed this up? And I think that's where storytelling and alluding to the media is. How do we capture these daily stories of men who are getting it out there? And I don't think um, we have to look, we don't have to look all that hard to find them. Mm -hmm. So I think what our big question is, how do we make this happen more quickly? You alluded to the issue of, you know, there's lots of men in many parts of the world who are out of jobs. The, the job market is changing in ways that folks are having trouble keeping up. If anything else, that's pushing families to figure out, wait a minute, it doesn't, I can't say anymore, you do this and I do that. We all gotta do it together. Mm -hmm. So I think I think it, it's happening. I think the question mark is how fast we can achieve the change that we want to. Like Nigel, I'm father of a daughter, or a daughter is, you know, has me. I don't know that I have her. She has me <laughs> as, as her co-caregiver. Um, and I, you know, I think, you know, as, as my partner and I look and sort of, you know, what do we see as our roles out there, there's no way but that the world has to offer equality for, for her. This is an imperative that all of us believe every single day. It's happening. How do we kind of make, how do, we, how do we help the damage control that needs to be there, and how do we speed it up? Um, so I, you know, I think it's got to be more concerted, it's got to be taken out of its boxes, it needs media, it needs big business involved, it needs governments involved, it needs voices of change there, telling the change, um, but it's happening. So I, I think it's a nudging, it, nudge it along to make it happen more quickly. And I certainly think it's happening here to some extent, and it's certainly, you know, in, 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 not, not everywhere, even in the United States, by the way, but in certain places, like, you know, more so on the coasts, I've even noticed, than it is in, in, in the, you know, the middle of the country. But when you look at countries like India, and you see, and you go to places like Africa, I am really, and India is just shocking. I mean, what, what's been going on there, yeah. and it's not even recently, it's just what goes on there, yeah. and what's always been going on there. I mean, those are places where I, I, we have to tackle the governments. We've got to have our, our governments have to stand up to theirs, and we've got to say we're not going to do business with you. Yeah. You know, we have to actually, you know, really draw a line in the sand. It can't be, you know, a financial situation. Oh, well, we have, you know, deals with them, or business with them. We're, we're not going to, we can't say that. We've got to say no. I'm sorry. You know, we don't agree with you. We don't work that way. Mm. We simply, and if we don't do that, it's not going to happen. I think we're going to have to draw some lines in the sand and say, address these issues. You know, start understanding, you know, that women are, forget about equal in those countries. They're so beyond equal. They're so low. I mean, it's not a, it's a question of like, women are treated in some parts of India as if they're the sixth caste down there, below the untouchables. You know, and you see what happens, and it's so disgraceful on so many levels. And, you know, and it's not just India, it's throughout that whole region, whole swaths of that, of that part of the world. And, uh, you know, and I've seen it firsthand, what's going on. And you know, when you look at the men's faces and the anger in their faces, yep. they're angry with the women. Yeah. You know, where the heck did that come from? And we have to address that. We have to be tough. And we, it's not going to be easy. And it's not going to happen overnight. And it's going to take some time. But the only way it's going to change is if we, we say, we're, not, you know, we're either not going to do business with you in this way, or this is how we're going to do business with yeah. you, if there's, you, you change. Yeah. All right, so last question. In, in the audience, we have an amazing group of influencers, press, makers, doers, change makers, powerful women, and a few men, um, and a few men here. Um, and so, you know, we're starting, a, we're, we three of us and, and everybody else are starting a movement. What specifically, what action steps can this community and, and the broader community online take uh, to addressing some of this stuff that we've talked about? Yeah, hmm. where to start? Um, you know, one, I think just the simple act of seeing men as allies in this work. And so whether, and, and I agree with all that Nigel was saying about India, but at the same time in this, you know, the vast country that India is, there are men, including at the village level, who already question this stuff. So I think, you know, one would be to say, look at the spaces where men can be involved in this, question this notion that the men's work is over here and the women's work is over here. Find the voices of change that exist. Wherever we try, even if it's rural Pakistan, there are men who question, wait a minute, honor killings don't make any sense, they harm us all. 
So I would say one is to find the men, and I don't mean to, you know, not to toot our horns up here, but to find the men who exist in all of these spaces who already are willing to speak out on it. Find them, get, get them to talk about, that, talk about it, support them, tell them they're still real men as they talk about this, they don't lose their, in fact, they gain lots of things. So that to me would be the first one. Find the men who already exist who are willing to talk about it and find them in all these spaces. Support is basically yeah, yeah. what you're saying. I mean, we, we need to support them. We need to support each other. And, you know, th there is no doubt that there's this constant sort of segregation is where I started yeah. the conversation with. And I, and I see it all the time. We're constantly segregating. And, you know, it's he and it's she. And it's, yeah. a, it's a she summit. And it's, you know, oh, well, you're... Next year's he, she summit. Right. Well, it, you, know, <laughs> the, it, you know, it should just be... We summit. It should be a summit, yeah. right? It should just be about people, people together. Summit. Coming yes. together to make a, life better for us all. You know, yeah. it, how, how is life a good life if one person is suffering in the family and versus another? You know, that's, this is, for me, this is the big issue that I feel that the only way we're going to address it um, is by collaborating and separate, you know, and, and getting rid of that line that divides between he and she. And that takes both sides. Yep. It's not just men, it's women as well.